people just because of a particular age, that's a cutoff. Um, we also think it is crucial to include innovations in technology to help us with our monitoring systems so that when there is a particular drug at a particular part of the, uh, the world that is being overprescribed or overused or that is linked to um, adverse events which are significant, then we are able to pick that up quickly. Um, and lastly, we also want to highlight the issue of training of medical personnel or other personnel who are involved in um, you know, prescription and might end up uh, practicing polypharmacy, which might be at risk uh, or might put people who are older at risk. Um, we think it is important uh, to also recognize that substance abuse among older people is a reality and it is important to address it without stigma in order for people who require help to uh, be able to access it. So the second aspect that I want us to look at, uh, which is also a highlight from the report, is about the functioning of the international drug control system. Um, this is covered in chapter two of the annual report, and what we do focus on there are promoting the consistent applications of treaties. Remember, the uh, International Narcotics um, Drug Control uh, Board works under specific treaties and, and um, conventions, or is guided by specific treaties um, and the conventions. We also need to ensure the availability of internationally controlled substances for medical and scientific purpose, meaning part of our job is to make sure that each and every country that requires these medications, be it for pain, be it for treating mental illness, be it for treating substance use disorders, each and every country must actually not face obstacles when they need to import um, these medications or when they need to export these medications. Um, we, uh, part of our role is actually making sure that the countries who are then involved in, in these different um, trades, um, you know, for substances, uh, also compliant with the treaties that govern um, these uh, functions. Action taken to ensure the implementation of the drug control treaties is also important to the INCB. So that means if we see that there is um, you know, a shortcoming in terms of a particular uh, controlled substance and how it's traded, it then becomes our duty to highlight this to the member states, to guide them, to offer advice so that they're able to practice all of this um, you know, uh, while respecting the different treaties. We also have specific initiatives that we take on to try and support different governments um, when they have to um, look at treaty adherence. So just to give an example, if we then look at the number of countries who have signed on to different treaties um, uh, under the conventions, we have got, for example, the single convention on narcotics drugs that I mentioned of 1961. If you remember, I referred to it and said it was the 60th anniversary this year. We have 186 states who have either ratified or acceded to that convention. Um, and then we've got the second convention that I mentioned, and that's the Convention on Psychotropic Substances of 1971. We have 184 states that have ratified or acceded to that convention. And then we've got the third convention under which we operate, and that is the United Nations Convention Against Illegal Traffic of Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances of 1988. For that one, we have 191 states which have ratified or acceded um, to that treaty. So what it tells you, therefore, is that the INCB's job is wide-ranging, and we cover quite a lot of these controlled substances. And what also is important to note is that as we do our work, we're also guided by the scheduling of the different substances, controlled substances, with schedule one being the least restrictive um, and schedule four being the most restrictive. And um, if we look at the annual report, if you read it in detail for those who are interested, you will find that there are specific scheduling changes for specific controlled substances which are mentioned. I'm not going to bore you with the long names because some of them really, you have to be looking at them to actually understand what they are. Safe to say, if you want specifics, please refer to the report. Um, and then the other um, aspect that I wanted to touch on, which is also a highlight, is about the availability of drugs for medical and scientific purposes. If you remember, we did say that it is part of our remit to make sure that countries are able to trade and move substances 
uh, which are controlled but licit. So if you look at the work that the INCB does, we are um, basically concerned with a number of um, uh, controlled drugs and examples are morphine, which we know can be a base for a number of painkillers. And in the world where we have been challenged by the COVID pandemic, it is crucial to make sure that countries have access to these types of medications. We also, for example, have um, drugs like benzodiazepines, which are also important, especially with COVID, because you may find that people who need to be admitted to ICU, for example, may actually need access to those drugs as well. And then one thing I need to highlight at this point is that the INCB is very concerned about the situation in Afghanistan, and we are highlighting this issue for member states to be aware so that urgent assistance can be, or can be offered and urgent action can be taken. So just to give a bit of background, there were consultations with the government of Afghanistan by the board under Article 14 of the 1961 Single Convention. And what the concern was had to do with a number of issues that touch on the movement of controlled substances and the production of controlled substances in that country. So the board is calling on the international community and United Nations agencies to urgently provide further assistance to address the drug control situation in Afghanistan. And efforts to stabilize the country will not be sustainable without also effectively addressing the country's illicit drug economy. So if one, for example, looks at um, you know, what is happening in terms of drugs there, we are aware that a significant amount of the, um, some of the drugs, that are specifically opium, that is produced and, uh, or, or rather con consumed across the world, the majority comes from Afghanistan, or the most comes from Afghanistan. Now, one of the things that I think is important to highlight here is that the board also supports government compliance with the treaties that we mentioned. An example is the board has got, um, you know, innovative ways that have been introduced which allow governments to register electronically. The reason this is important is governments can then declare uh, their needs in terms of what needs to be cultivated to produce these substances what needs to be uh, manufactured, what needs to be dis distributed, and what needs to be uh, sold or traded to different countries. So the ability to register this uh, for countries across the world means that the uh, situation is actually, or the process is more seamless, which is exactly what um, one of the uh, supporting um, issues that um, INCB wants to do is. So another um, aspect that um, INCB really takes part into to, to make sure that countries are supported is making sure that different country um, um, authorities who are responsible for making sure that this trade in controlled substances uh, takes place, meaning competent authorities, we actually offer one-on-one, -on -one, in-person, and even online training activities to make sure that the competent authorities who are responsible for this trade, or rather the um, processes behind the trade with illicit, subs uh, with illicit substances, we make sure that the competent authorities um, get training so that they are fully aware of what responsibilities lie within their offices to make sure that the country does not run out of essential controlled substances. Um, other ways that we support different governments um, to make sure that they are compliant with the treaties and the conventions is we have um, the GRIDS program, which is the Global Rapid um, Interdiction of uh, Dangerous Substances program. And all that means is that if there are illicit movements of these different um, controlled substances, then there is a system by which um, internationally, um, you know, different organizations are able to communicate with each other to make sure that that is stopped. And the reason for it is because as much as we all want to make sure that everybody has got access to controlled substances, but we also want to make sure that there is no diversion of these substances into black markets, into other markets which are actually unregulated and can result in a lot of harm. So it then becomes important to make sure that what we do as a board also supports not only the access to controlled drugs, but also 
um, you know, uh, supports countries to manage any illicit uh, production of the same drugs. Um, and then the last part of the report is focusing on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think all of us have been affected by it, so this one is crucial. So the global supply has been negatively affected, we know because of COVID-19, of both licit and illicit um, drugs. And this has led to shortages of some medicines in some countries. What we have done as a board is to look at recommendations for the international provision of controlled medicines for emergency medical care, meaning what can the board do to support countries to get access to these controlled substances so that the citizens of the country do not suffer because of COVID-19 um, and um, you know the restrictions. So what those drugs, controlled substances have included is treatment for mental health and substance use disorders, but also uh, treatment for uh, conditions that require painkillers, treatment for conditions that may require access to benzodiazepines. And this is just giving an example of what um, you know, INCB has been doing. In addition, we have also kept an eye on trafficking uh, which um, has affected or how it has affected the modus operandi and use of postal services to literally move illicit substances. Um, and lastly, the shortages of uh, substances, um, I think I mentioned that it also affected the illicit market. This has now resulted in a substitution with or in substitution with other dangerous substances, which in itself has put um, the global uh, world or, or rather the citizens of the different countries at risk. Because what it means is that if they are not able to get their usual uh, drug of abuse um, and they then go and buy from their usual source and they find that it's been replaced by something else, they therefore cannot predict how they're going to um, react which unfortunately can sometimes result in unintentional overdose and even death. So looking at the global issues and developments, um, there are quite a few that I want to highlight. Um, effective drug control as a means of fostering peace and security is an important factor, which is why the function of the International Narcotics Control Board is so crucial. Um, and I think it is also important to mention at this stage that the INCB is going on a drive to make sure that we as um, uh, the board and also the different member um, states um, have a collective approach to drug terminology so that what we say we mean is understood across the world. And then um, there's also a challenge which has been presented to the board and to the world at large. And the challenge is about the genetic engineering that has allowed cultivation of different substances, including cannabis, and the production of cannabis derivatives in the context of the International Drug Control Conventions. So if we then look at the global situation and the different factors that I'm referring to, I'm going to take an example for, from um, each region. So if we look at Africa, what we found as a board is that there's an increasing number of countries which permit or plan to permit cannabis cultivation for medical purposes. There's also the issue of continued trafficking and abuse of illicitly produced tramadol. And many countries do not systematically collect data on drug use or on avail availability of controlled substances for medical purposes, which unfortunately then leaves us with a blind spot. If we look at Central America and the Caribbean, there are measures in, uh, that have been taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which have resulted in decreased drug trafficking. And I mentioned this, you know, if there's a restriction in travel in general, that's also going to affect how people who deal in illicit drugs get their uh, merchandise out. There's also been issues of corruption, violence, and social and political instability, uh, which have been prominent in this region of the world. In addition to cocaine use, use of synthetic drugs and new psychoactive substances has also become more prevalent. And then looking at North America, um, in North America, uh, there's the issue of the regional drug crisis, specifically the opioids, the threats um, of the um, you know, epidemic, um, um, which has resulted in a number of um, deaths, which were obviously either accidental or overdose. 
In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in an increased number of overdose deaths um, for reasons that I mentioned before, and it therefore presents challenges in providing treatment. Um, and then the last aspect about North America is the issue of cannabis legalization measures and decriminalization. Uh, looking at South America, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the trafficking routes in South America and the micro-trafficking techniques. It has uh, affected supply of and demand for drugs. Um, and then manufacture and presence of synthetic drugs is increasing. One can see that this is actually, uh, you know, a consistent theme across the different re regions of the world. There are initiatives to regulate cannabis for medical and scientific purposes started in South America. And then in Colombia, there's been a decrease um, a, in the area under the cocoa bush cultivation uh, and an increase in cocaine manufacture potential. In East and Southeast Asia, we find a continuing increase in illicit manufacturing, trafficking, and use of synthetic drugs, especially methamphetamines, and data on drug use and evidence-based treatment programs continues to be lacking. Drug control actions must therefore comply with the rule of law and human rights standards. We think that is important as the board. In China, tw in 2019, there was a decision to schedule fentanyl-related substances. For those who do not know what fentanyl is, it is uh, very much used in uh, anesthetics and as one of the agents that is um, helpful in um, assisting during surgery. Um, so what has been found is that uh, the decision to schedule fentanyl-related substances as a class-wide group seems to have resulted in a sharp seizures in the substance. In South Asia, COVID-19 has ex exacerbated challenges related to trafficking, uh, increased trafficking in heroin and methamphetamines, and there's also been an increased ex exploitation of the internet, postal, and courier services for trafficking of drugs, especially psychotropic substances. And we do acknowledge that more research needs to be done on consumption patterns and trends to tailor treatment initiatives to local needs. In West Asia, again, COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in shortages on illicit drug markets and increased consumption of harmful domestically produced substances and pharmaceutical drugs. In Afghanistan, the illicit opium production in 2019 remained high despite a decline in illicit cultivation. And I think I'd like to go back here. If you remember, we had um, an earlier mention of uh, Afghanistan. Just to mention that up to 80% of the um, opium that is consumed across the world is actually mostly from Afghanistan. Hence um, the highlight that we definitely need urgent action there. And then um, in Europe, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in an increased use of internet and darknet to illicitly purchase drugs. There's also lower availability of drug treatment services and telemedicine and innovation towards treatment services has therefore started to rise. We're hoping that that's the kind of um, sharing that can be across um, the different parts of the world because that's at least a, a, a positive development there. There's also been an increase in synthetic drug manufacturer in Eastern Europe, with several countries taking steps towards legalization of the use of cannabis for non-medical purposes. You will notice that the issue of um, countries taking steps to legalize the use of cannabis for non-medical purposes keeps coming up across the different regions. In Oceania, or Oceania, Pacific Island countries and territories, um, we are finding that drug trafficking and illicit manufacture, uh, there's also um, you know, a, a growing um, demand for met methamphetamines and cocaine. And um, some of the countries in there are non-parties to the conventions that we mentioned. And therefore, there is lack of data on the extent of drug use and treatment demand. Um, there's also increasing trafficking of met methamphetamines from Asia across to Oceania. And then in Australia, we've got a 50% reduction in non-medical use of codeine. Um, and uh, we also have the Australian capital, uh, capital Territory legalization of cannabis cultivation. In New Zealand, um, we have a development where cannabis legalization um, was rejected by the voters. So as I mentioned before, you will hear that for each different part of the world, the issue of cannabis keeps coming up. Um, and I suppose it also reflects 
um, you know, the current status of um, the world when it comes to one of these um, drugs. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to touch on the recommendations that um, the board has then come up with, just to tie up everything that we've covered so far. So the use of drugs amongst older persons um, is an issue that needs to be addressed. And then we also face the challenge of cannabis for non-medical use and um, the issues governing cultivation for medical purposes. We also face challenges to do with treaty adherence in some countries. There are challenges with regards to availability of different controlled substances which are required for treatment, including during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's also an issue of human rights and peace and security which affects different countries and different regions tied to uh, the movement of illicit drugs. Um, we also have to be aware that um, you know, the human rights issue may also be tied to how countries deal with people who um, use drugs because sometimes you find that how the country um, applies its laws may also place the rights of people who use drugs at risk. There are prevention and treatment challenges, um, meaning people who require intervention for substance use may find that they, they struggle to get help. People who um, uh, were able to access help before may find that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's more difficult to access help. We also have challenges with data collection in some regions of the world and data reporting. Um, and in addition, if we think back to the controlled substances, a number of them are produced through um, using specific precursors or chemicals, and availability of these precursor chemicals is also a challenge, which may then affect availability of the actual medications. Um, and we also have emerging non-medical synthetic opioids and other dangerous substances which are coming up in the different markets across the world. Um, and these, of course, affect specific countries and regions. So what I'd like to do at this point is to just highlight the anniversary report, uh, specifically looking at the achievements. If you remember, I said we are, we've got the 60th anniversary of the 1961 convention, and then we've got the 50th anniversary of the 1971 convention. So if we look at the achievements of the board, which has been functional since um, way back then, uh, we're finding that there's almost universal adherence to the conventions uh, from different mem member states, and then the control of licit production, trade, and consumption of controlled substances has therefore improved greatly. And there's virtually um, no diversion that has been identified from licit international trade, meaning the uh, substances, controlled substances that have been produced have actually been uh, reported um, in the proper way, uh, respecting the treaties and conventions, and they have ended up where they were supposed to be going. Listed cultivation of narcotics plants and listed production, manufacture and distribution of and trade in narcotic drugs has been limited to estimated quantities required for medical and scientific purposes. So this is another way to say what I've just said now, that whatever is produced ends up in the uh, hands where it is supposed to go in licit ways. Governments have also prohibited the use of Schedule I psychotropic substances except for scientific and limited medical purposes and have restricted licit manufacture of these substances. If you remember, I mentioned that the controlled substances are managed under different schedules, Schedule I to Schedule IV, and that is what this aspect is referring to. Additional control measures have helped to stem, to stem diversion of Schedule II, three, and four psychotropic substances from international trade. Um, and then, um, in addition, um, the board has been able to support countries to ensure availability and accessibility of controlled substances for medical purposes, and um, has also been able to highlight to countries the importance of drug use prevention and treatment. Um, INCB has also highlighted the issue of proportionality when dealing with substance use 
and people who are on uh, who are using substances especially because proportionality is crucial when you want to respect human rights meaning if somebody is caught with something that they're not supposed to be having on them and it is an illicit substance it has been important for the board to highlight that the punishment should not be so severe as to infringe on that person's rights We've also highlighted the issue of illicit cultivation, manufacture, and distribution nationally. Uh, what has really helped here, it's, it's not just national, but it's also been international, and the GRIDS program that I referred to before has also been very helpful in making sure that this happens. Um, with the advent of new psychoactive substances, these have been um, successfully added and the different schedules within um, the conventions um, that the board applies. And in addition, the regulation of cannabis use for medical purposes has been done successfully so far. Although, as you've heard before, there are other issues that are coming up regarding the legalization of cannabis for non-medical use. The health and welfare of every citizen um, globally should be at the heart of drug control policies. And this is something that the board continuously says when we are dealing with different countries. I'm going to stop there at the moment. Um, I know that I've said a mouthful, but in so doing, I've been able to actually summarize the highlights of the 2020 annual report from the International Narcotics Control Board. And by doing so, I'm hoping that I will have enlightened a lot of people about the work we do and the areas of concern when it comes to um, controlled substances um, across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Zukiswa Zingela, for that compelling uh, presentation that you have given us. I know that a lot of us in this room are not technical in the area of uh, medicines and, and drug control. Uh, we've got to Councillor Melani, who's the executive mayor of King Sabata Dalingeba, where we are currently located. And uh, Councillor, uh, executive mayor, I, I know that, uh, you know, in, in my mind, when I was summarizing what this event was about, or what this presentation was about, it's I, 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 I summarized it in a sense that this is where health um, and, and this is where, so it's law enforcement, it's health and it's social development because the illicit use of drugs does have a major impact in our communities and that's where you come in then, Mayor, because you have got a bird's eye view but you're also very operational in every single community that we are in. So it's, a, it's an important uh, report and I'm glad that you were able to join us today um, in understanding and, and maybe even taking these conversations further with our Faculty of, of, of Health Sciences and to see how we can work hand in hand, the law enforcement in the country um, and in our province and in our city, as well as um, with our health experts um, and social development from your side. So thank you very much. I do really appreciate um, uh, your presence, Executive Mayor, and thank you, uh, Sisuki. The other, uh, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna open up for some questions. I am not sure if there are any questions that are popping up on the chat box. I am going to request Ms. Matabo Hendricks, our Deputy Director, to just keep a, a close eye on, on, on the chat so that we can just uh, take those questions. I do expect that the other board members that are part of, or, or that, that are following the proceedings today, that they will too be able to give input and feedback uh, in answering Answering the questions from the chat boxes that we have. Uh, whilst we are still waiting to see if we've got any questions coming up, I do want to just indicate that uh, if for example, you don't have a question at this point. Um, you know, the annual report will be available online. I do have a few copies that I have set aside for our own MECs, who I know some of them are joining us via, via video link. Um, our MEC for Health, our MEC for Safety and Liaison, as well as um, uh, Social Development MEC in the province. So I do have those annual reports that I will give to them, uh, but as you also go through uh, the annual report in your own time, and you come up with questions, you can send an email to Professor Zingela here. Her email address is z-i-n-g-e-l-a-z at m-w-e-b 
dot co dot za so it's zingela z at mweb dot co dot za so you can most certainly uh, send those uh, questions through to her um, and other board members if you've got the contact details for the other board members whilst we're still waiting to check if there's any questions that come through perhaps maybe i can let, give a little bit of a context um, around walter sisulu university our own medical school um, which is a highly rated medical school because of our problem-based approach um, was established 36 years ago and we have produced many, many doctors from this very university. Uh, from a geographical perspective, uh, we are, I, we, I did indicate we're located in Mtata. Mtata is in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa, and it can be classified as a rural town, uh, far from what you would expect in a first world metropolitan city. Uh, so we've got a medical school, a high performing medical school situated in a rural uh, town in the, in, you know, somewhere at the bottom of Africa. So that's who we are. I just want to check uh, Deputy Director, uh, Professor Zingela. I'm not sure if from the chats you are picking up any questions that we would need to respond to. Nothing. Okay, that's fine. But I have already given you, um, all the audience uh, that's out there, I have already given you the email address, but I will repeat it again um, as I welcome uh, Professor Tabana Maselesele, who's our campus rector. That uh, email address is Z I N G E L A Z at M W E B dot C O dot Z A. Zingela Z at mweb.co.za. Now let me welcome my beautiful campus rector. Um, she wears a beautiful crown of glory. You're going to see her just now. Beautiful lady. Um, if she, she's going to do our vote of thanks this afternoon as we wrap up today's program. Good afternoon, program director. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure about what you said but I'll appreciate that. To the Vice Chancellor in absentia, indeed this has been a memorable moment and I'm really highly honored to be the one who's giving vote of thanks. Being a campus rector, you should understand how proud I am when one of my own in the Faculty of Health Sciences has made it, you know, is, she's is actually putting us on the map, so I am really proud. I would like to first appreciate and give thanks to our international guests who visited, who attended this. Dr. Trumelo, the CEO of SAPRA, Ms. Zenat Abdul, the Associate Public Information Officer within the United Nations, Mr. Pizzo, Mr. Mpo Pizwane, the Program Associate Regional Office for Southern Africa in, within the United Nations. And also, I want to thank all members of the International Narcotics uh, Control Board. To our uh, local guests, I want to thank the, our local MECs within the Eastern Cape Province. I also want to thank the Executive Mayor of KSD. And I'm, great, I'm greatly honored to be part of, to, to, to really meet him today. Since I arrived during COVID times, we have not met. And also to the Executive Mayor, O.R. Tambo, to NAFCOC Business Chamber, we thank you for, come, for joining us. To the IMC, WSU IMC, I really want to thank you for joining this uh, uh, occasion. Also to our WSU staff members, the Mtata Hospital, the Nels, within the Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital staff, we really want to thank you for joining this event. I, I think... Um, to the Faculty of Health Sciences led by the Dean, Professor Mbokazi, I think I want to thank you for your leadership in the faculty and, and for the work that you are doing with, with your team. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor for the warm welcome and the opening address that she gave. And also that to thank her for reminding us about our challenges and that we need to continually address as a, 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 a university or a community that is concerned about the welfare of its uh, uh, people. Also, I want to thank Ms. Hendricks for introducing our guest speaker so well and also talk about the, pro the, the, the project like she is part of it and that was very interesting. Professor Zingela, I don't know what to say. 
you have just brought the information to our level. You have helped us. You stimulated the interest in us to go and read the report. I was not even aware that we have any, a hidden epidemic. And I think as a university, we really need to take this very seriously. Because I, I, I might think uh, when you see people taking some drugs, you think they're taking treatment. Can't you? It's the issue of being addicted to those kinds of drugs. So the report was very informative to us. And I think uh, you have stimulated that interest. We will eventually really do some work on this area. And I want to say to you, you have represented our country. You have also represented our university. And that makes us feel very proud and very happy. So continue to do what you know best. And also, we will make use of you because the fact that you have this information, you should know that you are in trouble because we will make, really make use of you to assist us in dealing with these issues. And I think our point of departure must be our research in, in this area because these are areas that are very looked down upon. You know, sometimes I always tell people that sometimes you need to first, you know, take out your clothes that people will start realizing that there is a problem here. You need to be assisted. So with that, I think you will actually assist us. To the program director, thank you very much and for marketing our campus as well, our university. Thank you very much for guiding us throughout. And to the organizers of this event, I really appreciate the work that you have done. ICT team, thank you very much. Members of Convocation who have joined, thank you very much. Everyone who have joined and participated in this across the world, we really appreciate you. And this is who we are. We thank you very much. Thank you. We did have a few additional questions uh, that popped up on the chat, but because we have come to the end of our program, I am a very strict program director. I had every intention to keep us here for the hour that we had promised that we will keep you for, but Professor Zingela has already responded via the chat, so you can follow some of the answers uh, to the questions that have been raised on the chat, which is uh, on the Zoom uh, link that we are on. Thank you very much, uh, my beautiful campus director, Professor for allowing us to be on your campus. Thank you very much and goodbye.